Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be uh, able to participate with you today in this conference. And I am pleased to have the honor of introducing our first speaker, uh, Professor Catherine uh, Gerbner. She is Assistant Professor of History at the University of Minnesota. Her research uh, focuses on the religious dimensions of race, authority, and freedom in the early modern Atlantic world. Her forthcoming book, Christian Slavery, Conversion, and Race in the Protestant Atlantic World, uh, shows how debates between slave owners, black Christians, and missionaries transformed the practice of Protestantism and the language of race in the early modern Atlantic world. Her research has been published in various uh, journals, uh, Atlantic Studies, Early American Studies, uh, the New England Quarterly, Slavery and Abolition, and History Compass. We're very pleased to have uh, Professor Catherine Gerbner here. Am I pronouncing that correctly? Yes. Here with us uh, to speak with us this afternoon about Caribbean reformations, black Christians, Protestant missionaries, and the limits of freedom in the Atlantic world. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. McKee, for that kind introduction. Um, and thank you to uh, Dr. Arogame and Dr. Daniels um, for organizing this wonderful uh, series of lectures um, on African Christians in the Reformation. I was delighted when I heard about the topic of uh, these, these two days, um, because of course, when we think about the Reformation, we usually think about Germany, about Luther, about the 95 Theses, as we just saw in this uh, call for papers. Um, and these are, of course, people and places that were integral to the movement that we call the Reformation. But I want to ask today, what happens when we move the center of gravi gravity outside of Europe and outside of the old world and into the Caribbean? And there we go. So my talk today is going to tell a different story about the Reformation. It asks what happens when we shift our focus from the continental European story and onto one happening on small islands that are usually associated with slavery, with brutal labor regimes, and with the production of sugar. What does the Reformation look like from the Protestant Caribbean? And what does it look like from the perspective of Africans who had been enslaved and forcibly transported to the Americas. Asking these questions, I think, reveals a new and important history of the Reformation. And most fundamentally, it shows that as Protestant Europeans encountered slavery and the Africans who had been enslaved, they were forced to reconsider the relationship between Protestantism, between freedom, and between literacy. So my talk today is going to have two parts. First, I want to bring you to Barbados. There we are. In the 1640s, and show you what was happening to Protestant practice when English settlers began to form slave societies. In order to justify the enslavement of others, slave owners used their Protestant status to separate themselves from enslaved Africans. They created an ideology that I call Protestant supremacy that excluded Africans and their descendants from Protestant churches. The second part of my uh, talk moves forward in time into the early 18th century and to the island of St. Thomas, which is now part of the US Virgin Islands, um, but was at the time part of uh, the Danish West Indies. And this shows what happened when enslaved and free Africans tried to join the Moravian church a small uh, Protestant denomination um, that was headquartered in Eastern Germany. So let's begin. Barbados. In 1657, the English traveler Richard Ligon published an account of his three-year visit to Barbados in the 1640s. At the time, Barbados was going through a major transformation. English settlers had begun planting sugarcane modeled on Portuguese and Dutch precedent in Brazil, and they had imported thousands of enslaved Africans to cultivate their sugar plantations. By the mid-17th century, when Ligon arrived, 
Enslaved Africans outnumbered both indentured servants and white planters. And these are transformations that have long been recognized by scholars. What has not been um, so recognized was that these transformations also occurred in the religious sphere as well. So in the history of Barbados, Ligon described an encounter with an enslaved African man who told him that he wanted to become a Christian. Ligon promised this man to do his best, and when he returned, he spoke to this man's uh, owner. To his surprise, however, the slave owner told Ligon that the people of that island were governed by the laws of England, and by those laws, we could not make a Christian a slave. Realizing that the slave owner had misunderstood his intentions, Ligon pointed out that his request was far different from that, and that he desired to make a slave a Christian, not to make a Christian a slave. The master, at last comprehending the issue, responded that being once a Christian, he could no more account him a slave, and so lose the hold they had of them as slaves by making them Christians, and by that means should open such a gap as all the planters in the island would curse him. So despite this planter's statements, Christian slaves are actually pretty easy to find in the Atlantic world. From Algiers to Mexico City, enslaved Christians labored on plantations, in workshops, in households, in cities, on royal plantations. In the Americas, Christian slaves were usually of African descent, while in North Africa, Europeans were regularly captured and enslaved on the Barbary Coast. Christianity, and specifically Protestantism, would eventually come to play a central role in the lives of enslaved men and women in North America and the Caribbean. In the antebellum United States, Protestantism was a core feature of pro-slavery ideology, and Southern planters claimed that their plantations were modeled on the slave-owning households of the Old Testament. So given this overwhelming evidence for Christian slavery, why did this 17th century English planter object when Richard Ligon asked him to introduce one enslaved man to Christianity. So my research on this topic began in part by trying to answer this question. Um, and in order to do so, I began examining the relationship between missionaries, slave owners, and enslaved and freed Africans in the Protestant Atlantic worlds. And I decided to examine um, the period when Protestant nations or Protestant empires first began to settle colonies in the Americas. So the, largely the 17th century and into the beginning of the 18th. This is also when Protestant missionaries began to consider the implications of African slavery for Protestantism. And geographically, I quickly realized that the Caribbean was the center of the most furious debates about the relationship between Protestantism, freedom, and slavery. So I focused most of my uh, research on the islands of Barbados, the Leeward Islands, and the Danish West Indies, um, though also maintaining sort of an Atlantic focus, examining the movement of peoples and ideas from the Caribbean to North America and across the Atlantic. And I noticed that many of the debates about the relationship between Protestant and, and freedom were moving eastward across the Atlantic from the Caribbean to Europe. We're so used to thinking about you know, the westward movements from Europe to the Americas. But I was seeing the reverse relationship. And the questions that I wanted, wanted to answer were, were these ones. First, what role did religion play in the foundation of Protestant slave societies? And what led so many Protestant slave owners to resist slave conversion? Because that question, I think, um, we have to begin with that if we're going to understand the second question, which is, when and why did enslaved and free Africans in the Americas choose to partake in Protestant rituals and join Protestant churches? And finally, how did this encounter with Atlantic slavery change the conceptions about true Christian practice? So I'm going to start with the first question. And what I found is that religion, and specifically Protestantism, was central to the formation of slave societies in the British, Danish, and Dutch American colonies. While most scholars have uh, viewed the Protestant Caribbean as irreligious, you know, focusing more on uh, sort of the brutality of sugar, sugar cultivation, cultivation, I found that Protestant churches, Anglican, Lutheran, Dutch Reformed, were fundamental to the maintenance of planter power. Planters developed an ideology, Protestant supremacy, that undergirded and supported 
slavery. So what do I mean by Protestant supremacy and how did it develop? In the 17th century, the slave-owning elite believed that their status as Protestants was inseparable from their I identity as free Europeans. They created laws and churches that codified Protestant status as a sign of mastery and used the established churches as a site for both punishment and politics. The Anglican and Dutch Reformed churches in the Caribbean separated masters from their enslaved heathen laborers and marked Europeans as both Protestant and free. The association between Protestantism and freedom was so strong that most slave owners came to dismiss the idea that enslaved Africans were eligible, even eligible for conversion. So in 1661, for example, the English parliament instructed the governor of Barbados to, quote, win such as purchased as slaves to the Christian faith and make them capable of being baptized therein The assembly of Barbados refused to. By 1680, the Barbadian planter's stance against slave conversion had become even more pronounced. So when William Blathwaite wrote to the merchants of Barbados to inquire about the conversion of enslaved people, the gentleman of Barbados explains that, quote, the conversion of their slaves to Christianity would not only destroy their property, but endanger the island inasmuch as converted Negroes grow much more perverse and intractable than others. So I argue that Protestant supremacy was the predecessor of white supremacy, an ideology that emerged after the codification of racial slavery. And I refer to Protestant supremacy rather than Anglican or Christian supremacy because I find this ide ideology present throughout Protestant American colonies um, from the Danish West Indies to Virginia. And it was most likely to develop in places with an enslaved population that was larger than the free population. So like Barbados, Jamaica, South Carolina. Protestant planters in these regions constructed a caste system based on Christian status in which heathen slaves were afforded no rights or privileges, while Catholics, Jews, and non-conforming Protestants were viewed with suspicion and distrust, but granted more protections. So I should also note that this ideology was always rather disingenuous. Um, Protestant slave owners knew that many of the Africans they enslaved were already Christian. Some may have been born into Catholic families um, in the Kingdom of Congo, and I think we'll be hearing about that perhaps a little bit later today. Um, Catholicism had, Catholicism had been um, established there since the 15th century. Others were likely baptized and exposed to Christianity in Portuguese or Spanish colonies. But regardless, when Protestant missionaries arrived in the plantation colonies, hoping to convert enslaved Africans to Christianity in the mid-17th century, they encountered slave societies that had already developed churches that were founded on exclusion. Planters regularly attacked missionaries and enslaved and free Africans who wanted to join Protestant churches, both physically and verbally, and blamed, uh, blamed them for slave rebellions, regardless of evidence to the contrary. Protestant missionaries responded to this hostile environment by articulating and promoting a vision of Christian slavery that reconciled Protestantism with bondage. Enslaved and free Africans, meanwhile, responded to planter hostility in a different way. So while most scholarship on Afro-Protestantism usually begins with the Great Awakening of the 1740s and later, um, my research revises this narrative and I demonstrate the significance of Afro-Protestant conversion before the evangelical revivals of the mid and late 18th century. I also argue that historians have overstated the significance of emotive worship for the appeal of Protestantism. While this was an important uh, feature of evangelical Protestantism, it downplays the powerful draw of literacy that the, these early missionaries offered. And finally, I found that there was a considerable disagreement between black Protestants and missionaries about the meaning of scripture and Christian ritual during this early period. These debates and exchanges about marriage, reading, baptism, honor, transformed the practice of Protestantism as it moved across the Atlantic and back. So thinking about the topics of the events today and tomorrow, I think it becomes in, uh, imperative to include this story um, as part of the Long Reformation. And um, I think the second part of my talk really begins to show why. 
So now I want to move to part two, St. Thomas. And I want to begin with um, what I think is a really stunning document. So sometime in the early 18th century, a freed African woman named Maratta expressed a desire to be baptized. Maratta, who was given the name Magdalena, was a native of Popo, a region in Western Benin, enslaved in the 1690s and transported to the Danish colony of St. Thomas, she labored on the island until being freed by her master when she was in her 70s. R widely regarded as a devout and pious woman, Murata had become increasingly involved with the newly formed Moravian congregation on the islands in the years after her manumission. At some point during this time, she chose to convert to Moravian Christianity. A few years after her conversion, she um, either wrote or more likely dictated this petition to the Queen of Denmark on behalf of, quote, the Negro women of St. Thomas, whose masters would not allow them to, quote, serve the Lord Jesus. Written in her native West African language and translated into Dutch Creole, Murata's petition was a stunning example of the use of the written word to appeal to powerful Europeans who might influence the St. Thomas uh, slave owners. The appeal was accompanied by another letter written in Dutch Creole and also signed by several other African Christians on St. Thomas. This letter went into more detail about the problems facing Christian slaves in the Caribbean. The white planters, quote, beat, a, beat and injure us when the Bas tisa, teaches us about the Savior, they wrote. They burn our books, call our baptism the baptism of dogs, and call the brethren beasts. The brethren being the, the Moravian missionaries. The second part of my talk today will consider the role that African Christians like Magdalena played in defining the culture and practice of Protestantism in the early modern Atlantic world, even as white planters tried to exclude them from Protestant churches. In order to interpret this document, we need to place it in the context of Protestant supremacy and the long Protestant Reformation. So in my discussion of St. Thomas, I'll be talking about three different Protestant churches, uh, the Lutheran, the Dutch Reformed, and the Moravian. So uh, the, the Dutch Reformed church was predominant on St. Thomas, um, and the Moravians were a small Protestant denomination that emerged in the early 18th century in Saxony, so now Eastern Germany. I'll also be talking about uh, pietism, the reform movement within the Lutheran church that sought to emphasize the experience of conversion rather than theological dogma and learning. Um, so first, let me introduce uh, the Moravians. So the Moravian brethren saw themselves as the oldest Protestant denomination in Europe, though they were uh, technically not founded until the early 18th century. They claimed descent um, from the 14th century martyr Jan Hus, a Czech reformer who anticipated many of Luther's later critiques of the Catholic Church. Um, they were also deeply influenced by German pietism. This combination was made possible by the Counts uh, Nicholas Ludwig von Sinzendorf, who you see here, a German nobleman who allowed a group of persecuted Moravian and Bohemian brethren to settle on his estate in Saxony. And they named the settlement Herrenhut, or Under the Care of the Lord. There, Sinzendorf and his community of refugees uh, experienced the religious revival that marked the founding of the modern Moravian church. And it, almost immediately after their revival, Moravians uh, began to travel around Europe and elsewhere to spread word of their religious awakening. Um, and it was chance as well as conviction that brought them to the Caribbean. When Count Sinzendorf traveled with David Nietzschmann, a Moravian carpenter, to Copenhagen to uh, attend the coronation of the King of Denmark, Nietzschmann happened to meet Anton Ulrich, an African Christian servant who had accompanied um, his master to Copenhagen. So uh, there are unfortunately no images of Anton Ulrich, so I've put up a letter well, a copy of a letter that he wrote. Um, this is, he wrote it after he, um, he went to Hernhut and afterwards he wrote a uh, note of thanks. So Anton Ulrich had been born a slave in St. Thomas and was baptized sometime after his arrival in Europe. Soon after his baptism, he was manumitted. And this conversion to Christianity 
represented a model of slave conversion that embraced both spiritual and earthly salvation. And under this schema, um, favored slaves could be singled out for attention and education. And oftentimes, if they were baptized, then they were um, subsequently manumitted. And it may be due to this connection between Christianity and freedom that Ulrich begged the Moravians to bring the gospel to his sister, Anna, who was still enslaved on St. Thomas. Nitschmann relayed this news to Sinzendorf, who saw the potential for a missionary venture to the small islands. Once they arrived on St. Thomas, the promise of literacy helped Moravians appeal to enslaved and free blacks and to recruit new members. So Friedrich Martin, one of the first Moravian missionaries, found that, quote, uh, some blacks could read and others had a great desire to learn how to read. Another Moravian wrote, among the blacks, there was an e earnestness and eagerness to learn, to hear the word of life, and to experience its immense power. They came often after work late in the night so as not to miss a lesson. Some of them traveled barefoot two or three miles through the stony mountains and returned home to begin work at sunrise. During their lessons, Friedrich Martin divided uh, his pupils into groups. Some learned reading, while others were taught spelling and writing. When the Moravian missionary Alga Spangenberg visited St. Thomas, he too was struck by the intense demand for lessons in reading and writing. His diaries are peppered with comments about the demand for reading among the enslaved and free Africans on St. Thomas. One day, Spangenberg spoke with an African man who, quote, wanted, wanted nothing more than to learn to read himself and be a Christian. Three days later, quote, a few women came to us and implored us to give them a lesson. We had already turned them away many times to test them, but they desperately wanted to learn and refused to give up. The missionaries were pleased and gratified by the popularity of their reading lessons. Like other European Protestants, they believed that literacy was central to Christian piety and that an intimate engagement with scripture could create the change of heart that was necessary for true conversion. Yet what did the practice of reading and the accessibility of books mean to enslaved and free Africans and Creoles on St. Thomas? Books um, were not just a source of religious inspiration. They were also uh, objects that had important spiritual economic, and economic power. So in a practical sense, it was through text inscribed paper that Africans could prove their freedom or their status as Christian. And the missionary Spangenberg um, strengthened this connection between text, freedom, and Christianity by giving newly baptized Africans baptismal certificates and telling them that the paper would protect them against re-enslavement by the Spanish. If you don't have this proof, he wrote, uh, you will ma be made into slaves again. But if you have a certificate of baptism, you will be set free. During the first years of the mission, Friedrich Martin gave many of his students spelling books, which quickly became highly prized possessions. Everyone wanted to have a textbook, wrote the missionary Oldendorf. Whoever was lucky enough to obtain one carried it with him everywhere and devoted every free moment to studying it. Within a year, Martin had given away over 133 spelling books in just two months, and he still had dozens of pupils eagerly waiting. One African man who had fought against rebel slaves on St. John recounted a story of how he was shot during the expedition. He said he owed his life um, to the Lord and that his book, which he carried with him everywhere, had been with him when he was shot. The loss of books could be devastating. When Abraham, one of the first baptized black Moravians, learns that his house had burned down, quote, he only lamented that his paper and his New Testament had burned, so he couldn't practice writing or remind himself about the word of God by reading. Martin comfort him, comforted him by giving him a new writing material, and Abraham later received a New Testament from a friend in, in Amsterdam. Another young man uh, had his book in his bag, and it was stolen from him in the night. He told Spangenberg that he hoped that the person who stole his book would, quote, learn so much from it that he becomes a true Christian. Afro-Caribbeans may have viewed the, both the act of reading and the possession of material texts as um, sources of power that could be adopted and utilized. 
Robert Robertson, an Anglican clergyman on, on Nevis, wrote that newly arrived Africans referred to reading as making paper speak, suggesting that literacy was seen as an impressive, if not spiritual, skill. This observation is important, particularly when viewed in the context of, Mor of Moravian lessons. A typical Moravian meeting included the recitation of a chosen part of scripture. And by organizing their meetings around scriptural readings, the missionaries reinforced their status, status as readers. As the audience, Afro-Caribbeans participated in this performance by both listening and interpreting. Spangenberg recorded a number of instances in which Afro-Caribbeans challenged or questioned the, miss the missionaries' interpretation of scripture. On one afternoon, the missionaries, the missionaries quote, read Christ's Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, in which Jesus advocates turning the other cheek. This reading led into a discussion of, quote, how one could accept being hit. At least one Afro-Caribbean man objected to this line of interpretation. Emmanuel, uh, an enslaved Creole man, answered that he could never turn the other cheek because quote, it would cost him his honor if he didn't defend himself. The missionaries explained to him that the Lord wanted it that way, that he shouldn't believe in his own honor, but in the honor of the Lord. Emmanuel responded with a compromise. Quote, he decided that he would ask God to spare him from the possibility of getting in a fight. Instead, he would prefer to stay home and learn. <laughs> Emmanuel's interactions with the missionaries provide insight into the negotiation over Christian practice and the construction of enslaved Christian masculinity. Emmanuel was not willing to accept the idea that turning the other cheek meant submit submitting to abuse without complaint. Instead, he reinterpreted the passage to accommodate both his sense of honor and his desire to bolster his education. He reaffirmed the missionary's desire for him to place God's honor over his own by asking God to spare him from the possibility of getting into a fight. At the same time, his preference to stay home and learn suggested the existence of an um, alternate source of honor. By becoming a learned man um, who could read, Emmanuel could redefine Christian practice and create a literacy-based Christian identity. And Emmanuel's approach gained him both respect and status within the Moravian congregation. Just 14 days after the discussion of the Sermon on the Mount, he was one of the first three individuals baptized by Spangenberg. Emmanuel, who was baptized Andreas, went on to become a leading male elder on the islands. He later traveled to Pennsylvania and Europe, um, where he died a few years later. And he was commemorated in Johann Valentin Haidt's painting, The First Fruits, and this is, um, the detail of that painting, and this is uh, part of this painting. So, like most Protestant slave owners in the Caribbean, planters on St. Thomas reacted harshly to their slaves' interest in Christianity. Some feared that conversion to Christianity was synonymous with freedom, and that converted slaves would be eligible for manumission. Others worried that enslaved Christians would be more rebellious than others. Spangenberg observed that there were economic and political elements of planter resistance as well. So if becoming a Christian meant that one had to observe the Sabbath, for example, conversion threatened to diminish planter profits by allowing the enslaved a day of rest. Uh, whites were also threatened by the idea that Christian slaves would be able to give testimony in court, which was forbidden. Um, underlying all of these fears was the fact that Christianity, and specifically Protestantism, remains an important axis of difference between masters and slaves uh, um, in 18th century St. Thomas. So while the idea of whiteness had become central to the island hierarchy, Protestantism was still closely aligned with freedom and status. As a result, slave conversion was seen as a threat to the very foundation of the slave society. As a certain gentleman explains to the missionary Spangenberg, quote, if the Negroes were told that all men were the same before God, it would weaken their respect for the whites and our lives would not be safe. These fears were not unique to St. Thomas. 
Protestant slave owners throughout the Atlantic world resisted the work of missionaries and the conversion of enslaved and free Africans well into the 18th century. But on St. Thomas, planters developed a very distinctive form of anti-missionary uh, resistance. They burned books. Both men and women played an important role in the attack on books. The missionary Oldendorp wrote, at the end of March, there was another emergency because white women kept taking textbooks away from the children and Negro women. They ripped them up and burned them, making things even more difficult for Martin, who already had a shortage. White men also played a part, sometimes assaulting enslaved and free blacks on their way to meetings. During these encounters, African Christians were systematically stripped of their reading materials. Some en enslaved and free blacks saw this mistreatment as validation of their decision to, become, to come to Moravian meetings. And one man reported that his persecution only intensified his desire to be a Christian. Indeed, books were such powerful currency in the planters' war of terror that the Moravians sometimes called their attackers simply book burners. The missionary Friedrich Martin fought against book burning by appealing to brethren in Europe. Within months of his arrival, he had already sent word to Amsterdam that he desperately needed more reading materials. Uh, yet but by May of the following year, he was still waiting. He heard that two loads of books had been sent on separate ships, both of which were captured by pirates. Um, and so he purchased books that had arrived from New York and further increased his supply by buying texts from Dutch people on the islands. While Martin was sacrificing his depleted funds to provide texts for his students, literacy was becoming a central issue in the governmental response to the Moravian presence. The governor of St. Thomas stated, he, he quote, did not hinder the conversion of blacks, but the governor forbid Martin to teach them how to write. The governor explains that fully literate slaves could in ignite a rebellion, and he reported, quote, a few slaves had plotted a rebellion through writing on an English island. The governor's statement is a reminder that the decision to teach both reading and writing was strikingly radical. While it was in unusual for enslaved men and women to learn how to read, writing was even less common, and it was a particularly powerful skill. As the governor was well aware, the ability to write could facilitate communication, among enslaved people across distant regions um, and provide blacks with the op opportunity to forge documents. The missionaries, for their part, didn't seem to consider uh, these aspects of writing, at least in the first years of their mission. Instead, their decision to teach writing was mostly just a response from the overwhelming pressure from black men and women. As Oldendorp acknowledged, quote, reading, uh, reading and learning to spell were not the main goal but the missionaries did it because the blacks wanted to learn. As the campaigns against the Moravian church increased though, Friedrich Martin and other members of the uh, Moravian church were imprisoned. It's likely that the, uh, they would have been banished from the island completely were it not for the unexpected arrival of Count Sinzendorf, the Moravian's uh, charismatic leader. Using his high standing and influence, Sinzendorf was able to secure the release of the imprisoned Moravians. But he was less successful in his efforts to convince white planters that the Moravian mission was not a threat to slavery. During his two weeks on the island, Sinzendorf met with several political and religious leaders. While the governor was sympathetic to the Moravians, most others were enraged by their presence. On February 11th, more than 30 white inhabits, inhabitants met to draw up a petition against the Moravian mission. They argued that slave owners should control the education of their slaves and that the Moravians' presence was unnecessary and unwanted. In the face of continued white resistance, Sinzendorf made one final attempt to align the Moravian mission with the institution of slavery. At the express request of the governor, Sinzendorf gave a farewell address to several hundred African men and women. The speech, which was written in Dutch and translated into Creole by Mingo, a black Moravian, emphasized the compatibility of slavery and salvation. Sinzendorf praised the whites who guided their slaves, quote, out of slavery to the devil, to the freedom of Christ. To the enslaved and free blacks, he stressed that long working hours did not conflict with Christian practice. Rather, those who were, 
quote, genu genuinely concerned about their salvation would find that Jesus will bless the little time that you have at your disposal. He urged them to, quote, remain faithful to your ma masters and mistresses, your overseers and bombas, and ask them to perform all your work with as much love and diligence as if you were working for yourselves. Sinzendorf reiterated that Christian baptiz baptism was in no way connected to freedom. Quote, a heathen must have no other reason for conversion than to believe in Jesus, he asserted. For Sinzendorf, earthly stations were fixed and ordained by God. The Lord has made everything himself, kings, masters, servants, and slaves. And as long as we live in this world, everyone must gladly endure the state into which God has placed him and be content with God's wise counsel. Not only had God ordained earthly stations, but he had also created race-based slavery. God punished the first Negroes with slavery, Sinzendorf stated. The blessed state of your souls does not make your bodies accordingly free, but it does remove all evil thoughts, deceit, laziness, faithlessness, and everything that makes your condition of slavery burdensome. The inclusion of a race-based justification for slavery in Sinzendorf's speech marked an important trend. As missionaries and their supporters sought to appease the fears of white planters, they increasingly turned to the language of race to demonstrate the stability of slavery and its compatibil compatibility with conversion. Evangelizing Protestants tried to reframe the debate about Christianity and sl slavery by arguing that race, rather than religion, was the defining feature of mastery. Sinzendorf's articulation of these points was not new, but they were part of a growing chorus reverberating throughout the Atlantic world. Now, despite Sinzendorf's efforts to appease the fears of white planters, persecution actually reached a peak, reached a peak after this speech. Um, after advocating for obedience and race-based slavery, a number of uh, after his speech, a number of blacks accompanied the Count Sinzendorf to town, where, quote, they were attacked on the public road by several whites carrying sticks and bared swords. These men then uh, rode to the Brethren's Plantation, where they, quote, attacked the Negroes who had remained there, beat them, injured them, forcing them to take flight. And when there were no more Negroes to beat up, they vented their wrath on chairs, glasses, dishes, and any other household utensils. Despite the terrorizing violence toward the brethren, uh, the missionary Oldendorp reported that the individuals who had been assaulted, quote, didn't complain about the beatings they received, but only about the loss of their books. That same evening, eight black leaders of the church took a bold step by writing directly to the king and queen of Denmark to defend their missionaries and their right to become Christians. This was um, a tactic of unprecedented daring as John Sensbach has written, demonstrating an acute awareness of the powerful potential of the written word. The first letter was signed by six African Moravians in the name of 650 black men and women. Addressed to the merciful king, the authors described the terrorizing violence that had plagued their congregation. We are steadfast in our determination, despite all the oppression by those who have come to beat, up, beat and injure us when the boss, Martin, teaches us about the Savior, by those who burn our books, call our baptism the baptism of dogs, and call the brethren beasts, declaring that Negroes must not be saved and that a baptized Negro is no more than kindling wood for the flames of hell. As the authors indicate, the Moravians continued to be plagued by the book terror that had characterized the first years of their mission. On top of that, their antagonists now mocked their baptism and rejected the idea that blacks could be saved. Yet even this suffering, they asserted, could bring them closer to God. Quote, we would gladly place our heads under the axe in defense of our congregation and for the sake of Lord Jesus. The second letter, which uh, I'm now coming back to, was addressed to the Queen of Denmark. And uh, as I noted earlier, was written by Magdalena in the name of 250 Afro-Caribbean women. In it, Magdalena described her own spiritual journey from Papa in Africa, where she, quote, served the Lord Masu. Now she was in the land of the whites, but she was, quote, not allowed to serve the Lord Jesus. 
In an intriguing statement, she wrote that, quote, when the poor black brethren and sisters want to serve the Lord Jesus, they are looked, on upon, upon, looked upon as maroons. Her comparison suggests that whites believe that Christian slaves, like maroons, would be unwilling to labor on plantations and that they would de demand a greater degree of freedom and mobility. Magdalena also um, asked the queen to intercede with the king to encourage him to allow uh, Martin to preach the Lord's word. When Count Sinzendorf departed St. Thomas um, a few days later, he brought the two petitions written in signs by the African converts along with his farewell speech. Two years later, he printed them side by side in the Budingische Sammlung, a collection of Moravian letters, diaries, and other documents related to the church. Now, while these three documents had the same purpose, to save the Moravian mission on the island of St. Thomas, they displayed a tension between black and white strategies for defeating Protestant supremacy. In his farewell speech, Sinsendorf emphasized the harmony between slavery and Christianity, capitalizing on the emerging, emerging language of race and arguing that Christian slaves would be faithful workers. The petitions written by the enslaved and free blacks, by contrast, lingered on the injustice of white planters, their abuse of enslaved people, and their radical dedication to Christ. While Sinsendorf essayed white fears, black Moravians asserted their willingness, even eagerness, to, quote, place their heads under the ax for the sake of their congregation and for Lord Jesus. The debates about literacy on St. Thomas demonstrates the, te the tensions inherent to adapting Protestantism to Atlantic slavery. As Moravian missionaries discovered, teaching enslaved and free blacks how to read and write was problematic. It helped them to recruit hundreds of baptismal candidates, but it fostered resentment from white planters and the government who feared that literacy would allow slaves to incite rebellion or run away. It also created tension within the Moravian congregation as black Moravians read the Bible and proposed competing definitions of true Christian practice. Eventually, the Moravians decided that it would be easier to excise literacy from their evangelical strategy. They decided to stop teaching, reading, and writing. The missionary Spangenberg would later write that the teaching of literacy was an invention that, quote, gradually arose in the church, and it led the heathen astray with its focus on knowledge as opposed to true heart religion. This was particularly true, he wrote, in the West Indies, where, quote, the circumstances of the Negroes and their hard slavery made it impossible to teach both literacy and true religion. Spangenberg, Spangenberg advised missionaries to be wary of those who, quote, merely wanted to know a great deal for to fill their head only with knowledge and at the same time to have an empty and unfeeling heart was a dangerous thing. The Moravians' rejection of reading represented an important adaptation to Atlantic slavery. While European Protestants, including the Moravians, generally viewed the, uh, reading, the script, reading the scripture as a central feature of Protestant piety, the pressures from both slaves and masters forced missionaries to redefine Christian practice in this context. They replaced reading lessons with a stripped down gospel teaching um, that focused on the tranquility and spiritual equality of the afterlife. In the following decades, Protestant missionaries elsewhere in the Atlantic world would come to similar conclusions and literacy often became viewed as a dangerous skill. But despite the missionaries' rejection of reading, black Christians continued to view literacy as an important practice. In the Moravian church, literate black leaders taught others how to read and write, thereby creating an alternate hierarchy within the church. The divergence between missionaries and black converts on literacy signaled a wider divide between white and black Protestant thought in this period. While Mor white Moravians tended to argue that conversion would make slaves more loyal and hardworking, black, black Christians insisted that they had a right to practice Christianity, and they highlighted the injustice of their masters for refusing to let them learn about the gospel. 
By the late 18th century, white missionary Protestantism with its ideal of Christian slavery would become a core feature of pro-slavery thought, while black Christians were developing a theology focused on liberation and literacy. Thank you.